passwords are without a doubt the most common security construct that we work with. Barely a day goes by without us entering at least one password or a PIN or some other form of authentication to prove that we are who we are before we access some form of valuable resource. Yet passwords are also one of the things that we most consistently get wrong. They're such a simple thing, yet they're so easy to do in an insecure fashion. Let's talk about where passwords usually go wrong. Most people probably know how they're meant to create passwords. But let's just recap briefly here before we move on and create some strong passwords. And I'm going to give you some good techniques to do that. So firstly, one of the things that people consistently get wrong with passwords is length. They create short passwords. And the simple reality of it is, the shorter the password, the more likely it is to be hacked. Obviously, people choose short passwords because they're easy. Less characters to remember, less characters to type. The problem is, it's also less characters for an attacker to have to get right. Now, that might be less characters they have to guess if they're trying to log on to someone's account online. It might be less characters they have to crack if they've broken into a website and stolen passwords that are cryptographically stored. The way we create passwords is just simply one of those intersections between convenience and security. The more convenient we make them, the less secure they become. But that's just one attribute. Another area that we struggle with is randomness. I gave you a few examples of different passwords in the introduction of this course. They were not random. The word password is not a random string of letters and numbers. It is a very, very predictable word. And when you think about it, there are a lot of very predictable passwords out there. Your dog's name is a very predictable password. And if you use that, you're making it exceptionally easy for people to figure out what your password is. Not only that, but if the password ever gets compromised somewhere and you have to change it, it makes life very hard on the dog as well. Don't use your dog's name or your children's name or your significant other's name or other obvious names for passwords. None of those pass the randomness test. One of the things you need to remember with randomness is that we're not just talking about lowercase letters. We're talking about a mix, lowercase, uppercase, numbers, non-alphanumeric characters. So things like punctuation. All of these contribute to this desirable password attribute of randomness. But even if you get these two things right, you have a long password and it's nice and random. There's another really big fatal flaw in the way people handle their passwords, and that's uniqueness. Now, the problem here is that people tend to have a password. When someone talks about their password, often it is just that. They're one password that they use in many different places. Now, the issue here is that as soon as that password is disclosed in one place, Anyone who holds it now effectively has the key into all the other places that that same password was used. So when you look at incidents like those data breaches that I just showed you in the introduction of the course, any one of those sites that's leaked someone's password puts all those other sites at risk as well. And this is what often happens. Password reuse means that one website gets hacked, the user's password gets taken, and then they suddenly see compromises on a whole bunch of accounts on totally different sites. Let me give you some examples of that. Here's the real issue with password reuse. Let me give you three simple examples. LinkedIn, Dropbox, and MySpace. Three very big, very familiar names. In 2016, each one of these had very large amounts of data exposed publicly. LinkedIn, 165 million accounts. Dropbox had 69 million, and MySpace trumped them both with 359 million accounts exposed. 
Now, in a case like LinkedIn, if you had a password that met those three fatal flaws in the previous slide, length, randomness, uniqueness, and then you used it other places, now you've got a big problem, a much bigger problem than just your LinkedIn account. In fact, even if you had a very good password, and it did pass the length and randomness tests, but then you failed the uniqueness test and you used it other places, you've still got a problem. We need a better way of handling passwords. How we create them, how we recall them, and then how we use them on websites. Let's go and start talking about some solutions. One of the alternatives to using a password, so that is just a single word as we would normally think of it, is to use what's referred to as a passphrase. So for example, instead of using the password password or the dog's name, what if you used a phrase like this? What's Roger got for dinner? It doesn't have to make any sense. It just has to be something that you can use as a way of identifying yourself when you log on to websites. Now, this is great for length and it's great for randomness. This is not a common phrase. Don't go and use something out of Shakespeare or something that other people will have thought of but it may not necessarily pass the requirement that many websites set forth. So for example, it doesn't have any numbers. It is actually a very good password, even without them, but it might not be enough to satisfy the requirements on the site you're using. So you might need to use character substitution as well. In this case, A's become an at symbol, O's become zeros, E's become threes, etc, etc. You've probably seen this form of character substitution in many different places before. And it's one other way of adding some degree of randomness to the password. Although it's worth noting, hackers have worked this out. <laughs> they know that people do these common character substitutions. But in combination with quite a unique passphrase, this is not a bad password. Sometimes we find there are other barriers to using a password like this on a website. So for example, the website might say, you can't have apostrophes, or you can't have spaces. So we could always manipulate this phrase and turn it into an acronym, something like this. This is still a 10 character password with a good mix of uppercase, lowercase, non-alphanumeric characters. It would satisfy many requirements of a password. Perhaps it might fall down in some places for not having a number. But the thing about password requirements is that there's no consensus as well. So trying to create a good strong password on a website can become a bit of an exercise of trial and error. So there's some good strategies for creating fairly strong passwords. However, there remains a problem. And the problem is that most people then try and remember them. Now, don't forget, you need to have a different password for each service that you use, because even a very good, strong password puts you at risk if it's compromised in one of the places that you use it. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to recall which password has been used on which site? Let's take a look. Here's the simple truth with strong passwords. Your memory is just simply not very good. Let me give you an example. You might say that the passphrase we just looked at would be a good one to use on your LinkedIn account. That's great. But now we need a different one for Dropbox. So we make up something else. Again, it doesn't matter how silly the passphrase is. It just has to be something which is highly unlikely for anyone else to discover. And we'll make another one altogether for MySpace. So this is great. We've got these three strong passwords in the form of a passphrase, but we can't put them in memory. Okay, maybe you can put three in memory and you can recall them perfectly. But have a think about how many online accounts you actually have. It's almost certainly not three. It's probably closer to 30 or even more because these days we are required to create passwords in so many different places. So how are we going to create strong, unique ones and then not try and remember them? Well, there is one very simple answer. 
Some people joke about this, using a book to physically write your passwords in. But if using a book is the thing that helps you create unique passwords that are strong and you can retrieve them when required, that is a very good start. You have this risk, which is that someone may get their hands on the book, but they need physical access. This is not something that a hacker on the other side of the world can do. And frequently, when people are compromised online, it is from a long distance. It's someone from somewhere on the internet. So as a starting point, a book is actually not a bad idea, particularly if you keep it in a safe place at home. But there is a better way, and that's password managers. Let's go through the mechanics of what a password manager does. And the first thing is, it helps us generate passwords. Now we've just been talking about passphrases and they're a good way of actually having a password that you can enter again into a website. Some of them you may be able to commit to memory, other ones you may write down. But the whole premise of having a phrase is that it's something that our human minds can work with. When we move towards a password manager, we no longer have that constraint. So we can start to talk about generating genuinely random passwords. So for example, let's generate something with a length of 20 characters. Within those 20 characters, let's have three digits. And then we'll also have three symbols. If we were to generate genuinely random passwords using those criteria, we'd end up with things like this. These are very good passwords. They definitely pass the length test, they're also random and they're also unique. So the only problem we've got now is how do we actually recall them? Well, this is really at the heart of what a password manager does because we're going to take those passwords and encrypt them with what's referred to as a master password. So the master password is the one password that you actually need to remember. It's probably not going to look like one of those three passwords we just saw. It's going to be a passphrase or some other form of strong password that you can commit to memory. But you're only committing that one password to memory. And by doing so, you have the key to encrypt and decrypt every other password that you generate. Now, when you do that, the password is stored within a vault. Different password managers have different words for it, but for all intents and purposes, it is just an encrypted collection of your passwords. Crazy passwords, passwords that you would never be able to remember yourself, but now you don't have to because the password manager looks after it. Of course, you need to protect that master password very, very carefully because that's the thing that will get you access to every single other password. But so long as you're using a reputable service and you've got a strong master password, password managers are enormously effective and they're the best mechanism we have today for dealing with the reality of how we need to create and protect our passwords. Now, one more thing on passwords. Don't forget just how many places you have them. So for example, you have a password to unlock your phone. It may be a pin, it may just be numbers, but it's still the same premise. It's still something that only you should know. If your phone isn't protected, we'll come back and talk about that a bit later on in the course. You should also have one on your PC because you don't want anyone else just to be able to sit down at your PC and access all of your personal information. You don't want someone else in your house to be able to do that. You don't want someone who may steal your PC to be able to do that either. So passwords are pretty critical on a PC. Even your wireless network. Most of us have a Wi-Fi network at home now. Make sure you have a password on that because you don't want a situation where someone else comes and logs on to your network and accesses your personal content and your internet connection. Your Wi-Fi password protects your entire network. And just like with the PC and the phone, we need to aim for these attributes of long, 
random and unique passwords. So that's some password fundamentals. Let's now move on and talk about website security.